Good afternoon and welcome to the Future of Finance discussion on AI, machine learning and robotics around financial services. I shall now pass you over to Dominic Hobson and the panel. Hello everybody, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance and welcome to our webinar on the meaning of AI, machine learning and robotic process automation in financial markets. Our subject today is the mirror image of a theme that runs through almost everything we talk about at Future of Finance, namely data. Because what robotic process automation and artificial intelligence do is ingest vast quantities of data and apply vast quantities of processing power to it. It's not using reasoning powers akin to those which some of us possessed. It's not using uh, reasoning to prove conjectures or offer explanations. It's just looking to automate repetitive tasks, find useful correlations. Uh, in, a, in that sense, at least, intelligence uh, was never more brazenly misapplied than it is to artificial intelligence. Yet RPA and, and AI are undeniably effective, especially in redistributing work from people to machines, which has given rise to competing visions of utopias of endless leisure and dystopias of mass unemployment, slavery and extinction. Now to help us navigate a path between these two imposters, uh, we're joined by five people who are between them helping companies large and small to develop and apply these technologies. Bob Bonomo is founder and CEO at Next Stop Consulting, a firm whose three-stage digital pathfinder model helps SMEs embrace rather than fear digital transformation. Dr. Francesco Carrier is research lead at Boulders and Capital, an early stage VC firm that has raised more than 3 billion for disruptive startups over the last 20 years. James Denning is an SVP EMEA at H2O AI, the Silicon Valley based provider of a hybrid cloud auto machine learning platform whose declared mission is to democratize AI, including making it available to even the smallest companies. Prior to that, he worked at Automation Anywhere for four years, building their European operation from a standing start to over 250 people. Dr. Ian Robethon is a client technical leader and IBM Quantum Ambassador in Financial Services at IBM. Dr. Cam Starr is a self-confessed future optimist, creative scientist and maths geek who has gamified platforms, the Bank of England and the ECB, and who is now working in the AI Labs and Emerging Tech Division at Blue Prism, a company which aims to transform the way work is done in a variety of industries, including financial services, by combining robotic process automation with AI. Now, in addition to our panelists, we do, of course, also have you, our audience, and all five of us, as always, at the Future of Finance webinar, encourage everybody watching or listening to submit questions and comments throughout this webinar. Indeed, we've had some questions already. Please keep them coming. We will not save them up to the end, but we'll answer them as we go along. Now, this is a vast subject, so I'd like to get going immediately. Uh, and I'd sort of like to begin by seeing if we can establish some, some terms of reference for this discussion. Uh, and um, Ian, perhaps I could come to you first about this. Does it actually make sense for us to distinguish between AI, that's you know, data crunching algorithms, cognitive AI, which is the kind of reasoning with purpose that I referred to at the outset, uh, machine learning, which I assume is just finding patterns in the data that's being ingested, and robotic process automation, i.e. automating these routine or, or repetitive tasks. It, are those sensible uh, divisions? Are all these things merging into a single process? Are they different aspects of a single process? Uh, hi, Dominic. So, you know, I, I think, I mean, the categorization you make there are, are relatively straightforward and what we see in the industry. I, I think, I mean, it can get very gray between, well, artificial intelligence can be such a broad term. You know I mean, I mean many things to many different people, uh, but no, I certainly in, in my own mind, I separate AI from machine learning. And then specifically RPA is something separate. I mean, far more focused on, I mean, looking at those processes, ways of automating manual processes, et cetera. But all can be used in some shape or form to what improve uh, customer experiences when it comes to banks specifically, or in actually looking to reduce backend cost. I mean, from, from a bank, as it looks to cope with the modern day challenges that, that we see in the industry today. James, what's your what's your perspective on that? And, and perhaps you could give us a hint of where you think these technologies have got to. I mean, Ian has, has, has explained to me that he doesn't think these technologies are converging on a sort of single process. They are. It does still make sense to distinguish between them. But 
um, what, A, what's your view on that? B, where do you think these technologies have actually got to in terms of, in terms of development? Uh, I'm thinking here of, of progress towards natural language processing uh, and genuinely cognitive AI as opposed to data crunching. So I think Ian's quite right. Yeah, they're not converging on a single, you know, a single technical solution, but they are definitely starting to kind of merge together to an extent. So if you go back five years ago, RPA was in its infancy. Um, there was a whole load of, of clear kind of greenfield space for, for you know, companies, for people to automate very rules-based processes. And in many ways, though, those are the low-hanging fruit. You know, if you have a process that's essentially if this, then that, that's relatively easy to automate. And where we are along that journey, um, there's still a long way to go. You know, I'd say, yeah, if you take the, the if you take the enterprise space, take the 100 or 500 biggest companies in, in the world or in Europe or in the UK, they'll all be doing something in automation, but how far that technology has actually penetrated into those companies, still for me, not a huge way. Yeah, we're certainly not at 50, 70, 80% penetration. But companies are now starting to look at uh, intelligent automation. So this is how do you address those high hanging fruit where the data you're working on isn't maybe as nice and as hard and as easy to access as the as what you're doing your rules based automation. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if you get a spreadsheet full of invoice data, and one of your workers takes that and inputs that into the ERP system, that's quite an easy thing to automate. It's very rules based. Whereas if you take a massive stack of uh, PDFs from suppliers, they will all be slightly different formats. Those formats will change over time. And that's much harder for a bot, for, a, for, a, you know, for, a, for an ERP system to, to input. Um, if you use cognitive technology, so machine learning technology, that as it processes that unstructured data and it turns each invoice or purchase order or whatever it is, it figures out what sort of document it is and then extracts the key data out of it. And as it does that, it gets better at doing the next one. This is kind of the definition of machine learning. Once you combine that ability to understand that semi or unstructured data with your rules-based processing, and this is what we call intelligent automation, you start to be able to address a whole load more use cases. So I think those technologies may not be converging themselves, but they're starting to work well together to get to where companies want to get to, which is more and more automation across the, the, the processes that they have. Uh, Cam, can I, can I bring you in at this point? Because you're, you're actually working in a business which is doing this stuff for real inside financial institutions. My understanding is that, is that an AI application doesn't aim to completely automate a process. It's actually looking to build a machine which can work alongside humans. In other words, the AI is complementing what humans do. Is that a, a good guide to roughly what's going on? Or is it a much more complex set of scenarios than that? Well, I think that's that's where we are in the journey. I think the the, the notion of augmenting humans has been something that you know we, we'd look to for machines to augment what we do, to support what we do, and to James's previous point uh, around intelligent um, automation, intelligent document processing, for example, one of the um, one of the folks that we work with, Mashreg Bank, uh, they used exactly what James just described in terms of using intelligent document processing, and they managed to gain some sixty percent improvements in their productivity but they essentially they reduce the processing time from 48 hours to three hours so that's a 94 percent reduction in time handling documents that were coming through you know masses of documents going through that information being looked at now um, that doesn't mean all the people were taken away it just means that the role of probably shifted from one who was inputting a data inputter to some you know to a much much smaller kind of workforce that are are then verifying. So you, you, what you want to do in, in, in finance in particular is, you know, you, you want to make sure you're not making any mistakes. And of course, computers and, and AI in particular um, is that cross-section between data and, and how sure you are, it's your certainty, you know, it's, 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 it's the accuracy of the model. Now, you, you're never really going to get a 100% accurate model, especially with unstructured data. Um, or with the data that has some ambiguity. And that's where the role of the human comes in. And I think where we are in that cycle, we're still looking at a kind of the centaur model as the augmented human, as the, as the, the machine and the AI supporting the work of the human. Um, but I mean, you know, we, as we move further forward, and we can see this in the world of chess. Um, so in the world of chess, there was a time where 
the idea of an augmented chess player was a uh, was was all the rage. You know, you use the machine to to play chess and use an AI to play chess with a human because the the, the chess was very good at you know looking a few thousand moves ahead, but the human had the strategy. Well, we're not there anymore with chess. We've already moved to. We, there's there's no question. There's no there's no reason to have the human anymore. And so, if you look at the, what happened in chess, and I'm, I'm not saying all all problems are you know, deterministic and a, and a small, you know, set of rules that drive them. But I think we're on the same path. And I think we'll, we'll be moving in that direction that chess has gone, where there's no question about it. You don't need people to play amazing chess. In fact, the computers play it better than anybody ever could. Um, so, yeah. Could I, could I just add something very quickly? I, I absolutely agree with you, Cam. But actually, the, the chess analogy is a brilliant one. I was lucky enough a couple of years ago to, uh, I got to spend some time with Gary Kasparov. Uh, and I actually asked him that question, said, what was the hardest opponent that you ever faced? And this is, you know, going back when he was playing competitive, you know, properly competitively. And he said, actually, the hard because I said, was it the IBM supercomputer? You know, was it, was it, uh, you know, those two famous matches, which he won one, he lost one. Or was it one of the other, you know, great players from the golden era of chess, you know, Karpov or Fisher or whoever? And he said, neither. He said, the hardest opponent I ever faced, and I agree with you, I think time's moved on from now, but he said, the hardest opponent I ever faced is a decent journeyman player augmented by a computer. Because he says that combination of perfect recall, perfect analysis, statistics, you know, as far as you want them, combined with that bit of unpredictability, that little bit of flair, he said, that's impossible to play against. And he says, I stopped doing it because I lost and I hate losing. And I'm the greatest chess player, this was his words, of all time. Uh, but I think you're right. I think things have moved on. But there's still, I think there are many fields where that augmentation, that combination of man and machine is still very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm but, not chime in. I also believe that uh, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. So a lot of things that were old are now new. It's always about augmentation. Uh, I, I, I equate uh, loosely the RPA phenomenon with the expert systems uh, back in the 80s, except for obviously computational power and, and capabilities are much higher. So it was very rules based. But so they, I do believe they are separate. But as, as both uh, Ian, Cam, and James said, um, the combination of the, the uh, cognitive uh, analysis and the repetitive uh, rules-based systems are going to be the, are going to be merging over time. I was going to ask and, you, Bob, um, d d just a bit, from a point of view, actual commercial implementations of this. Um, you heard Cam, for example, talk about. It. We lost Dominic. I just lost. Uh, I think we've lost we've lost Dominic. So Ida, Ida oh, he's can... back. I can see him moving. Yeah. Again. yeah. Okay. My, my, I'm afraid my internet is a bit unstable today. There's a huge gale blowing outside, and uh, it, it may knock me out completely at some stage. In which case, you'll have to talk amongst yourselves. But uh, the question I was asking was to Bob, and it was about the, the the risk that AI, by increasing your your certainty in a particular finding or outcome, leads to an increase in risk. You become overconfident about what the machine is telling you, and you become excessively tolerant of faults it might have developed. Is that a risk which your clients yes. are alive to? Yes, and once again, I, I always look back to history. Uh, any quantitative models, uh, traditional quantitative models have to have some sort of uh, confidence factor. Um, and that is, is even more important given the vast amounts of data and the automation uh, associated with financial services. So um, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Now, Francesco, I'd, I'd like to, to, to bring, bring you in just with some sort of high level questions about um, on this same topic, the, the risk of an AI misleading you or even, even making mistakes. How do you, when you're looking at making investments in these um, the technologies, uh, how do you avoid, in effect, coding human biases um, into, into an AI algorithm? How do you um, avoid extrapolating from the present endlessly into the future. So you imagine the future is always going to be like this. Are those risks which AI presents and, and how alive are the companies you're talking to, to the risk of, how good are they at managing those risks if they exist? It's a um, it's a brilliant question, and if the if the answer was easy, we probably wouldn't even like need to talk about it. Uh, so if you were expecting me like to give you a one line, you know, reply to that, probably uh, I mean that's like the biggest mistake that we can do today. But that said, uh, I think that. Uh, 
Dominic, partially the the answer to uh, well to your question lies in the the question that you were asking uh, before to Bob, the comments that Cam made, and eventually what also James was mentioning. So, like first of all, you have to think that the model, which is something that uh, we should be like super clear about, the model and the, you know like the prediction that an AI can make and like the way in which the system works it doesn't have to be perfect and it shouldn't be, okay? Because eventually it's that 1% of error rate or 2% or 5% or whatever it is that actually gives the model for one and the flexibility of changing. If the model was like 100% right, I mean, it wouldn't be like flexible enough like to adapt and change like to new inputs, right? So that's like point number one, which eventually means that the, that always gonna be something that you have to use judgment or, you know, like, make the call yourself on specific things. And of course, like, there are stuff that might make more sense for a human to make a call on and other things where probably you don't really need to question whether the next uh, movie that Netflix recommend to you is the, like, the right movie for you, right? I mean, it wouldn't like change that much. Um, but when it comes to biases, there are things, well, there are honestly, <sighs> Not every single bias is easy like to be corrected. Um, if you if you want to think in biases term, there are at least like four or five different biases that you can, you know, take into account. Uh, probably even more, right? But I mean, like at least like four or five that I can think of. And some of those biases are easily correctable to some extent. So like one of the classic examples that people do in this space is, you know, like the Thai bot uh, that Microsoft put out like a few years ago that was, you know, released on Twitter and was like, you know, interacting with users. So the bias that comes through interaction with humans are something that potentially you can correct if you train the human as well to interact with the machine in a correct way. And what happened with an example, I mean, we all know that, but eventually they both turned out to be, you know, Nazis and fascists and all those things in about like 24 hours, which is something that I hope we don't want to happen again. Um, so there are there are a few specific things that you can correct and other things that are more harder to correct and potentially there might be technical solutions to that. So when it comes, for example, to my specific, you know, field of applications, I'm using right now, you know, a bunch of different techniques and things to try to scout for signals that can tell me whether a company is a good company or not, okay? which is, you know, it's very like uh, edgy in terms of application and it's not easy. And of course, I, I, I have to base most of my analysis on, you know, historical data sets, which means that there is a risk that if a company, let's say, has, you know, a co-founding team of like three people and all the companies in the last 10 years that were successful at three people in their co-founding team, the model would suggest that probably like three is the right number of co-founding team members for the next company, like the next Facebook, the next Uber, whatever. Um, which is, of course, and this like to close my answer and loop it back in from, 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 yeah, from where I started, there are things that actually come down to our trust and judgment. Um, and Honestly, from a technical perspective, a lot of, well, most of the time, I mean, not every, not every single time, but most of the time, it comes down in, uh, to, to the way you specify the variables that you're, that, uh, that you're working for. Uh, meaning sometimes we are forced to proxy some variable with something else because we can't really capture that specific information. And this is what, what in my code specific biases like to jump in, in your model. If you can, you know, disentangle enough the variables and go like to the very bottom of the matter, some of these biases disappear, which is not like always the case, but it's, it's always like a good, a good starting point. Thanks uh, for that, Francisco. I'd like to bring bring us back down to earth a bit and talk a little bit about specific applications of these technologies inside companies. But before we do that, perhaps we could just think about this, uh, uh, James. I'd like you to, to address this at a at a sort of high level, um, which is, uh, do you, if you're implementing an AI inside your bank or your fund manager or your insurance company or whatever, do you actually need to actually rethink and redesign the workflows and the processes? And Ian, I'm sure you have views on this as well, uh, before you can actually do anything. In other words, you can't just take the existing process and think, well, we'll automate that. You have to start all over again and think, well, what are we trying to uh, achieve here? And we've got a question come in from a member of the audience, which, which is germane to this, which I'll ask in a minute. But uh, James, give us a thought on that. And then Ian, perhaps you'd chip in as well. I think with, with any of these technologies, the answer is it depends. You know, so whether you're looking at 
you know, using a, a machine learning model to, you know, to, to automate something where a human was making a, a you know, a value-based decision, or you're using, you know, uh, a fairly standard RPA te technology to take a process that's currently got the handle being turned by several people, and instead you throw cheap robotics at it, it depends. Um, process re-engineering and process automation for me conceptually are two quite different things and if you think about the aim for the business what you're trying to do essentially is to there, there are several outcomes you might want you might want to save money uh something cam mentioned earlier actually i thought was really relevant you might want a better service or product delivered to your customer you might want to increase morale but there are lots of good outcomes that, that you could be looking for but if we take the basic the, the the most obvious one for a lot of this which is to to reduce cost um people often say you can't automate or apply ai to a, to a broken process but the reality is that 99 percent of the time a process isn't broken it's just very inefficient. When we talk about a bad process or a broken process, it's just taking you a lot of time and effort to do it that you could simplify if you went and re-engineered it. But you know what? If you've got five people uh, operating some process, let's say accounts payable, you know, they cost you a lot of money. I'm going to approximate they're costing you half a million bucks a year and you can replace or get send them off to do something else and do that job instead with 10, 20, $30,000 worth of robotics. You don't care if it's a bad process or an inefficient process. You've just saved yourself a lot of time. And while some people in IT, and I used to be a software engineer, will look at that and say, hey, that's, that's a really uh, inelegant solution. You know what? It gets you the right business outcome. Now, there are other processes you may look at and say, you know, if we just throw cheap digital labor at that, actually, we don't get the outcome we want. If we want to streamline a process and make sure, for example, Cam said something earlier about now this process runs quicker, that's better for customers. Sometimes you do need to go and re-engineer processes. So I think it really does depend on, on the outcome you're trying to get. Sometimes just that, that digital labor arbitrage, you know, using an AI engine instead of human can deliver a great business outcome. Sometimes it won't, and you need to fundamentally re-engineer your process and maybe find value you can extract by dint of using artificial intelligence that you couldn't do if you were doing a human. One example there is where you have very wide data sets. If I gave any one of us 2 million uh, customer records and said, right, I want you to look for patterns in that to find out which ones are going to, you know, be money laundering, you know, standard AML stuff. That's impossible for a human to do, but a machine learning algorithm can cope with that width of data. So that's one case where you can actually do qualitatively different things with machine learning that you can't do with a fundamentally human-based process. James, do you think that though in general for RPA type of repetitive tasks, the, the process of, of pseudo process engine re-engineering of collecting the, the information, simplifying it and removing redundancies does not help in the analysis necessary for the RPA solution. Yeah, I think so. I think one of the great things you get from, from an RPA platform, um, you yeah, know, where I worked for years is by dint of automating your process, you also find out the, that you understand it, you know, whether you're using blue prism or, or automation or anyway, UI path, what comes out of the back of you automating, essentially you then have, uh, you know, you can look at what's in a bot's head. You can look at that script or that bot and look at what it's doing in a way that you can't, under UK legislation at least, look inside your employees' brains and find out what they're doing. So, yeah, one of the great outcomes is actually that, that process map. And we're now seeing mm -hmm. the advent of very clever technologies around process mining. You know, process mining where you plug clever software underneath your big databases, your ERP systems and your CRM systems. And by looking at who accesses what data when, they can build that extremely accurate process maps across a wide range of processes. And at that point, then maybe is the time to go in and say, right, do we need to buy an RPA platform? Do we need to get some BPM people in? Uh, do we need to get an Autowell platform? It gives you a really good view of the universe. I think process mining is, uh, is going to be a big step forward for all those technologies. Uh, and just to add to what James said there, yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree with most of it. I think for me, when when sitting down with with companies, it's you know, I mean, what's their what's their business strategy? What's their business directive? Is it you know, I mean, do they want to improve mortgage originations significantly? Uh, do they want to you know, I mean, loan approvals? And in doing that, you then can start to unpick the existing processes. And right, you know, I mean. Does a tactical fix of, of what could be poor processes, automating them, does that achieve the business result? Or do you have to do something more strategic where you start to define new processes and you build automation into them as day one? So you know I mean? as I think James mentioned, it depends. 
Yeah, but it's it's the scale of the change that the business wants to drive that, in essence, determines how much re-engineering and transformation you want to make of those underlying processes. And I know we've yeah. talked about, you know, I mean, the mortgage origination. I, I know another trending topic is is around AI ops. So let's not forget, you know, I mean, actual service delivery, delivery people, maintaining platforms, etc. I mean, automation is coming in there again to augment the engineer who's making sure that services are full of it, fully available 24-7. Yeah. And to, to chime in with, the, with another example, we, we work with Invesco, uh, investment managers. So these were folks who were spending day in, day out, analyzing, uh, doing portfolio management, doing a lot of research. And, you know, exactly to, to, to James's point of having to sift through masses of data in order to, to make this work. And so... Uh, there, they use digital workers to actually help with the, the gathering of the, uh, and the analysis of the data and really massively reduce the manual workload that these folks, these quite expensive analysts, were doing. The upshot of it was that they, they delivered something like a 90% business process efficiency gain. So all the, if the boring stuff of trying to find all the material everywhere, going and looking, pulling all the information in, all of that was then done with digital workers because it was rather repetitive and the decision making the kind of the high cognitive uh, insights was then that was the that was the work that the uh, the analysts were you know it's the work that they enjoyed doing and it ended up being now taking up all of their time rather than just 10% of their time so it delivered enormous benefit to the business and remember as well i think dominic it, it's it's not one or the other you know frequently you'll see uh, maybe a temporary or a short term uh, RPA-based automation solution being rolled out. And in the background, there'll be a full IT transformation project that may take all of those processes and turn it into one lovely, big, new, shiny thing. But the joy, and I think where RPA was fundamentally quite different for a lot of previous technologies was it, it was incredibly cheap and, and, and quick to implement to deliver a large amount of the business outcomes you wanted, you know, 70, 80%. And you could do that and be reaping the rewards of that return, your time to return on investment was always very quick compared to traditional uh, IT transformation, which might take six months, 12 months, 24 months to get to return on investment. Heck, it might take that long just to deliver the project in the first place. So you can, it's not an either or, you know, you can, all of these things complement each other. And you may have a long-term solution that, that while you're rolling that out, you're using some short-term band-aids, if you like, to, to get temporary, uh, to get a quick return on investment. Okay, now I want to ask one of the questions which has been raised, but Francesca, you, I think, wanted to add something very quickly here. Yeah, no, I just want to want to make like a more general comment, which is I'm making like in this in this like finance forum, but I think that there's actually like applicable to different contexts uh, that builds up on the on the uh, line of thinking that James had, but it's also like not uh, you know like hundred percent like on the same rail to some extent, and the thing is. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the work of uh, Luciano Floridi, who is like a guy, like a professor at uh, Oxford, super, you know, great philosopher, computer science researchers. Um, and it's a guy that he was like uh, putting out like a few years ago, the idea of the infosphere. And basically the main, the main thing that he put out there uh, was, you know, this concept that eventually, especially for AI, which is kind of, you know, uh, it, it happens once in a while with technology, is not the technology adapting to us, but it's most of the time us adapting to the technology itself. So some of the stuff that James was saying, they are true, and some others are simply, you know, when you actually have like to use RPA or AI or call it whatever you feel like, it is not necessarily true that you are bringing that technology in, plug it in, and everything works brilliantly. Sometimes you have to make changes yourself in your organization, which is why he was mentioning processes and all the stuff, right? But that happens also like to your, you know, like traditional daily life. I don't know if any of you or anyone in the, in the, in the audience had like a vacuum cleaner robot. I mean, this is far from the true. Yeah, me too, right? But this doesn't really adapt to your environment. It has to be you, you know, like lifting up the chairs and putting everything, you know, like all the cables aside and all the stuff, right? So this is like one classic example when eventually we need to adapt to the technology and not vice versa. But, um, and, I, and I'll finish this like with a final, you know, uh, weird comment, but uh, since we were talking about games before i mean it makes sense also like to um to to bring in the most famous you know like event of the last five years in ai which was like the go game 
you know, AlphaGo, uh, DeepMind, blah, blah, blah. The, the twist there, like the, 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 the really interesting thing, in addition to, you know, like all the fact that the, that the computer was able to win a game that was unsolvable, blah, blah, blah. The real interesting thing was that in game number two, uh, the human lost against the machine, right? And if you, if you trace back the game, there was one specific move that made the entire game, which was uh, move um, 37, okay? So after a while, commenting on that game, uh, listed all say, this is actually the move that break the entire game. Because I mean, it made me, you know, questioning everything. That wasn't a move that no human would have done ever, you know, in the life of the universe, okay? Um, he lost, great. Goes ahead, game, uh, game number three, he lost again. Game number four, uh, spoiler alert, is the only game that he won, okay? One game out of four. And the reason why he, he, he won the game, it was because at move 78, which is like, again, one single move, he did something that no human would have done ever in the life of the, of the entire universe. Because he basically learned from what the machine taught him in game number two, and made like a very similar crazy move in game number four. So like the, the, the machine itself was, you know, like astonished, if that's like a feeling that machine can feel uh, of, of that specific move. And like all, all, all this, you know, uh, weird uh, fact is simply, to, is simply to highlight that all these processes and things that we are doing, they influence us as much as we influence them and vice versa. So eventually it's, it's a much tighter, you know, uh, link between our technology that we are thinking these days. And that comes to processes, that comes to applications, that comes to, you know, multiple things. Thanks, Francesca. Now I'd like to ask a question, one of our member of audience who says, this is David Kolb, who says, many technology firms describe themselves as having an AI operating model. As incumbent firms in many industries describe themselves as technology companies, how successful have incumbents been changing their operating model to unleash AI's potential. I'd like to add to that. Do we know of any examples where an, uh, um, a newcomer, a new entrant, has used AI successfully to disrupt an incumbent? So how good are the incumbents at using this AI and how good are new entrants at, at using um, AI? Cam, I'm looking to you to give us an imaginative answer to that question. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one because I'm, I'm trying to think of who I can think of who's who, so AI gets misused a fair bit, right? It's quite a buzzword. And, you know, sometimes we actually mean, as you alluded at the beginning, uh, we, we mean AS, which is artificial stupidity uh, and, and, and rules-based. There's nothing intelligent about it, but, you know, we, it's, it seems to be badged under that. But, um, you know, I think, I think if you um, now, it depends again, with how far do we set our sides? So Uber being an example of a company that is, didn't exist 10 years ago, I believe, uh, and is now taking over the world in terms of its size and dominance in the kind of personal transport. And it heavily relies on machine learning in order to be able to route people and set the rates and all of that. It's massively successful. Of course, the, the, the environment it was going into was not technology driven. I think one of the things we've seen is the incumbents, if we take the big um, the, the, the big four, for, for instance, so, you know, the, the Amazon, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, um, the, um, and, and IBM. And, and if we look at those guys, one of the things they've done is they've started to commoditize the AI in a way that we probably didn't imagine would happen so quickly. So we had a huge flurry of new startups opening up in the last five years. If you go back three, four, five years ago, um, there was lots of companies that were promising to bring out lots of different services that you could do cognitive-based um, extraction or decision-making and all kinds of things. Um, and, and now we, we're at a point where actually those things have become very, very commoditized. We, we're looking at a marketplace where you can go and get a document extraction from Google, from Microsoft, from Amazon, from IBM, from anybody you know, in a way. So actually we're seeing the commoditization of the AI. And I think the, the big winners of those are the incumbents and this is the very large ones. Uh, and I think it's been much more difficult for the up, for their startups to, to make a very strong foothold in that and, and really defend it. I mean, sometimes they do get bought up and obviously that's, 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 a, that's a great thing. But yeah, I think it's, um, I think this, I'd give this one to the incumbents personally. I think it's very, sorry to, to add to that. I, th I think the really hard thing is that artificial intelligence is really difficult 
it's a really complex technology. It's not something that you can just kind of, it's very hard to do AI light, you know, if you like. And, and one of the big problems facing the industry is that there aren't that many data scientists around. There aren't enough data scientists and they're very, very, very expensive because, you know, they are the, if you like, they're the kind of, uh, business automation process world version of neurosurgeons. Yeah, they take a lot of time to train, they're hard to get hold of. Uh, you need to pay them lots of money. Um, so I think the, the whole concept of, I, I'm not sure I know what an AI operating model is. And I think I agree with Cam that AI is uh, like, it, it's a buzzword. And in the same way that 15 years ago, every company in the world uh, prepended the word internet to their company name in order to drive up their share price. I think companies are doing that today. Yeah, it's, oh, we're an AI company. What's that mean? Um, I don't know. Um, but I think, uh, I think I agree with Cam. Um, the trick to AI is making it accessible to your workforce. So if you think about, if you make it a constant theme of everything you're doing, I think Uber's a good example, you know, and pretty much everything they do, they're saying, yeah, there is the question. It's almost one of their company tenets. How can we apply machine learning to this problem to make it better? Um, uh, in the same way that Amazon have that basic tenet of how can we change this thing we're doing to make it more customer centric? That's why Amazon succeeds is they look at every single thing they do. Where are we going to put our offers? How do we do this pricing? Who do we acquire? Everything revolves around that being customer centric. If there is such things as an AI operating model, it's looking at everything you do and saying, how can we use machine learning and AI to augment that? And one of the new ways of doing that is AutoML. So trying to reduce your reliance on data scientists, that's the reason there is an auto ML category. It's the one I happen to work in. The reason for that whole category is how can we not minimize, but how can we let you extract more value out of your data scientists and let people in the business, the kind of off misused phrase citizen developers, get more access to those AI capabilities, but it's hard. James, I agree with that. I, I think the, the term AI operating model is an aspirational one, uh, but the way I view it is looking at your company as a 360 degree model from client acquisition to repetitive process automation to value add uh, proprietary systems to back office automation. So looking at your company's uh, value streams and attempting over time to apply intelligence to the, those processes, that, that's the way I describe an AI operating model. Now, uh, James has brought up the sort of labor market question and, and Francesco alluded to this as well. That we, you know, it, it, there is interaction between the machines and the people here and they have to get used to, to working with each other, if, if you like. Uh, one of the things you almost said there, James, is that actually one of the effects of using AI is you replace very cheap people with very expensive people called, called data scientists. Now, um, we've had a question here about what can organizations do to build trust with customers and employees in the proper use of AI and customer products and reduce staff anxiety about being replaced either by machines or more skilled individuals. And one of the thoughts that occurs to me here is that actually AI uh, can scale, in, in principle could scale very quickly. And so you could see whole swathes of jobs disappear in financial services much, more, much faster than we actually anticipate at the moment. So um, Cam, give us a, give us a, give us a, what, how can you reassure our, our audience member here about how do you manage this transition? You've got this machine which scales and throws them all out of work in a matter of weeks. I'll, I'll, if I maybe start with by uh, quoting Aristotle uh, from uh, from uh, fourth century BC. A bit of philosophy at Future of Finance, we love it. Yeah, you've got a bit of place. So, so, so I think I believe is he said something along the lines of uh, uh, when looms uh, when looms weave by themselves, man's slavery will end. And so the, the idea of these looms weaving by themselves and the end to man's slavery. Um, what, so look, I think. There's obviously, there's always going to be, and you know, from the time of Luddites to today, there's always this worry that machines are going to take over. And we know throughout history that this is, you know, this, this yes, there is a short term uh, a period where the readjustment needs to be made, but the nature of work itself changes. And I think what at least we've, we've seen in a lot of the cases is um, um, when it comes to automation, it doesn't lead to uh, lots of jobs being lost. Quite the opposite. It's because People don't have enough workers. You know, you don't have enough workers to do the high value work. You're having to employ lots of people to do relatively low value. So if you can automate that, if you can use AI to do that, then you can free up your staff to do the high value work, to do the customer engagement, to do the, the, the stuff that actually, you know, helps to expand the business. So rather than seeing it from a, 
it's going to cut the business down. The business probably doesn't have enough workers. Um, and yeah, there will inevitably be some, some readjustment, people having to relearn stuff, not having, you know, not, not having uh, repetitive things that you can do without m huge amount of engagement on the cognitive side. Um, and I think that's inevitable, but that's been, that's been the story of, of you know, the, the last two and a half thousand years and particularly accelerated since the industrial revolution. And as we move forward, um, this, this, there are new jobs, there are new things that didn't exist 10 years ago. There will be new things that will exist 10 years from now. And if we stand, stand right back from it, you know, this idea of a universal basic income, which was complete crackpot idea, uh, perhaps 10, 15, 20 years ago, is actually starting to sound like, hmm, well, we may need to end up in a universal basic income type situation because let's face it, the looms are weaving by themselves. The man is free of slavery and there probably isn't enough things to keep people doing stuff that absolutely needs to be done. So I think there will be some adjustment, but it will, you know, pe people are people. And as much as we'd like to go at the speed of technology, um, you know, we, people will go at a particular pace it is coming, and you know, but I don't think it's it's an it's an alarm that's going to suddenly wait. We're going to wake up one day, and it's going to be completely different. It'll be a transition. I do think there's there's an interesting difference to this fourth industrial revolution that we've not seen before. That all the industrial revolutions before have really affected the blue collar worker. You know, think of farm. You know, farm works on. Farm, you know, I live in East Anglia, so I look out at you know fields as far as the eye can see, and I've got friends who are farmers here, and I say, yeah, thirty years ago we had twenty five firehands. Today there's two of us. You know, people in factories. You know, you talk about the original industrial revolutions. For me, this is interesting because this is the first industrial revolution that's affecting the knowledge worker. And I think that is quite scary. And I think the mitigation you gave is absolutely spot on. You know, you can explain, you can make sure people understand what exactly will happen and what won't happen. But for me, that's a, that's a cause of uncertainty for people. There are people who always thought, I'm always going to be in my job. But now they're seeing, you know, the rise of intelligent automation kind of come over the hill. I do think we need to differentiate, though, between AI uh, and machine learning that we're talking about and that general purpose AI, you know, of a thing that looks and, and sounds and tastes and smells like a human, because that, for anyone listening, that's not here, and that won't be here for a very, very long time. Well, we've had a comment from one um, member of our audience saying, how can I get involved in AI-based jobs? So if anyone's got uh, some suggestions as to how this person could find employment in this industry, uh, let us know. Um, we had another question here. Um, as large businesses implement RPA, RPA and AI, what are the operating model considerations? For example, should Agile precede AI? And we talked about this a bit earlier. Maybe there's a, a very quick answer to this. Um, should Agile proceed AI in? I, I don't know. Yeah, let me, uh, I think they coexist, to be honest. So I'm you know, working with many companies who are operating you know, in Agile methodology for software development, uh, be it, say, you know, virtual agents, for example. And I mean, the, the developer is just incorporating AI technology into his code, you know what I mean, to make it more, more beneficial to, to, to the end user experience, et cetera. So whether it's Agile, Waterfall, you know, I don't think it matters. It is just now AI now is so accessible or the technologies, be it natural language processing, discovery, et cetera. A developer can just consume those via APIs, via, the, via cloud, I mean, and incorporate them into the code that he's he or she is developing. And they can go through I mean, agile approaches. In fact, that's better because as I think as we're all alluding to this, this total AI vision of the world, you know what I mean, the Terminator or, or whatever it is, you know what I mean, we're not there. It's all augmentation, augmentation uh, that's driving efficiencies and improvements in pretty much everything, be it software product, SaaS products, or end-to-end or -end services that, that consumers uh, take benefit from. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, um, just before we leave the, the question of, of um, and thank you for that answer, Ian, that's very clear. Um, before we leave the, the labour market impact, and, we, and, and James touched on the fact that even knowledge workers are now going to be um, lose their their livelihoods. Do you, by replacing people with machines, actually lose something? Is there a kind of tacit knowledge that you use? Are there a lot of old people sitting in the back office um, who've actually, through 30, 40 year careers, learned something really valuable, which can't be coded into a machine? Is there a risk that you're losing tacit knowledge? 
I think that has to be addressed uh, proactively because as you said, 30 years of, of experience is something that uh, you don't want to lose as a company. You want to encapsulate it into new, new uh, opportunities to utilize those skills and those, that knowledge base. Uh, I do think that's a potential risk. It's just a, it's just a race to see how you can capture that, uh, document it, and then utilize it, uh, and then re re refer to it over time, right? You don't want that fully uh, embedded only in your, your automation tools. You need to have that as a reference point so that you, you as, a, as an organization, can continue to improve on that and then feed that back into the automation uh, models. While I've got your attention, I'd, I'd like James and Ian to chip in on this as well. Uh, you've got you've got um, people who may be digitally challenged in the back office but know a lot of stuff, but you've also got very large IT departments inside a lot of these companies. You've got all these legacy systems. Now, to what extent is the IT department a friend? To what extent is it a foe of uh, of AI and, uh, and robotic process automation? And what extent are these legacy systems lying around a huge obstacle to to making progress. What's your, what's your experience of that, Bob, with your clients? Um, I, I like to describe it as friends with benefits, um, right? It's okay. really- Sounds good to me. Uh, I, IT is, is always gonna be a key component. Now they have the, the requirement to uh, coordinate and collaborate with data scientists and domain experts. So I, th I think it's a, it's a combined effort. Um, I think the degree to which the impact will be felt is accelerating, but IT is a friend in my opinion. In a way, uh, and perhaps James, you have something to add on this. And I'm sure you do. And you know, one of the questions we we had from a member of the audience is, what are leaders in technology doing to prepare themselves for the complexities of building and operating the, these AI solutions? So, James, what would be your answer to that question? Is the is the CTO the friend or the foe of what's going on here? Uh, I, th I think it's changed. You know, and, and uh, RPA very specifically is a bit different from all the other technologies in this respect. That RPA is a bit of an existential threat, or can be viewed as an existential threat to, you know, to DevOps teams, especially because one of the propositions is, hey, all that big complex IT transformation stuff you're doing with hundreds of engineers, we can do it with a much, much smaller number of engineers. Now, how true that is, I think is very much up for debate, but it's certainly been perceived like that. Four or five years ago, I saw we saw a lot of resistance from IT leaders. That has mainly gone away now that the enlightened ones or the ones who have become enlightened are seeing those automation technologies, including RPA, as another tool for them to use. Um, but I think the, the question about what can leaders do to prepare themselves, especially around AI, they need to educate themselves because we, we've said earlier, AI is a very, very broad topic, you know, and you can't just say, hey, yeah, we're going to use AI. What's that mean? That's not saying, hey, we're going to use computers. Well, that's a very, very broad question. You can use computers. There are lots of different shapes and sizes of computers. They can do a million things. And that's where AI is heading towards. So I think the best thing you can do is understand um, what are the capabilities out there? What is, for example, the difference between you know clever document uh, classification and management and, and analysis and more general person or more den general purpose automail? What are the use cases if you're in banking and financial services? Um, how does KYC get changed? How does anti-money laundering get changed? How does uh, post-trade reconciliation get changed? So you need to educate yourself to understand what are the capabilities today where will those capabilities go over the next one, two, three, five years? Uh, and how do they apply to, to your specific business? Ian, can yeah. I, can I, okay, I know you want to comment. This is relevant to what you're about to say, I think, which is a, a comment from somebody in the audience. I was listening to another webinar and they indicated it was easier to move to machine learning than AI and AI costs so much. Question, my question is, are most people moving to AI or to machine learning? They indicated most companies are not really doing tr true AI. And I, I think that's relevant because as, as James mentioned, you know, RPA is different from AI, ML is different from AI, cognitive AI is different from AI and so on. So to answer our, our, our audience member, David Jones here, um, what are most companies actually doing? They're, they're not doing true AI, they're doing something else, right? Again, it, we get into definitions. I think broadly for me, I mean, there is AI, there's machine learning, and then there is, there is RPA. And they are, they are the broad uh, topics that, that we cover. Uh, but yeah, I think, I mean, any, any CTO, CIO facing the challenges what the industry has today of I mean, improving experience for their clients as well as driving cost out of their business, then I'd say that AI in its broadest term, and that includes machine learning and RPA, is a core part of their strategy going forward. I mean, and they'll want to embrace it as much as they can. I think the whole governance around AI, 
is is starting to uh, I mean, develop and create. I think companies now have AI strategies, like I say, principles, how they're going to adopt AI, you know what I mean, that they want to be open with people with. You know what I mean? We're in a society where, you know what I mean, you, you need to be able to prove if you're declining people for loans, you know I mean, you've got to be able to show the regulator why that is the case. You cannot just leave an AI process, you know what I mean, completing something in a black box to which you are not able to articulate, you know I mean, what logic it has followed. And that Frances talked on bias, you know what I mean, is a huge topic. And again, companies are starting to understand and be able to measure and continually measure where they're deploying AI to make sure, you know I mean, bias is not being introduced in, in some shape or form, not purposely. It's just, Frances mentioned, when you're data scientists, and you look at historic data, I mean, there can be a bias in that data that you need to identify and remove such that your AI model can I mean, learn, understand and go forward and then continually check on it as well. I mean, so organizations are developing all these new governance models to, to embrace this, yet be open with it as well. Well, I'm glad you brought up the ethical question. We've had a question on that as well uh, from Colin Bristow. Uh, ethics is a challenge when considering the use and application of AI and machine learning techniques. Do the panel believe there could be any ethical issues in this techniques when applied to robotic process automation? So he's wondering whether the ethical problem is AI exclusive or for robotic process automation. But to your point, Ian, I, I noticed the other day that the UK Competition and Markets Authority is actually investigating the use of AI uh, now to reduce competition, you know, by personalizing prices, excluding competitors, and facilitating collusion between companies. And, you know, clearly that needs, as you say, needs to be audited, uh, policed, and so on. Uh, and then you've got all those problems with racial and gender profiling. And Francesca brought up the, the, the Microsoft app, which began to misfire when it, it, it encountered real people and so on. So law, regulation, and indeed our whole ethical personality. I'm sure Cam will bring up another pre-Socratic or post-Socratic philosopher to, to enlighten us on this. But um, I could, I could offer perhaps a, a bit of humor, uh, Dominic. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, and, uh, and, a machine learning algorithm walks into a bar. Barman says, what will you be having? The machine learning algorithm says, what everyone else is having. Um, <laughs> which is to say that the machine learning is trained by looking at what everyone else is, is doing and, and, and saying. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that kind of encapsulates the, the, the root of the, the problems with bias. Okay. Uh, in the, because we look at historic data and you know, the, the, the ethical questions there is to um, have, um, have a positive, um, if, if you like, uh, a positive approach to to being able to s become aware of those things. Um, but is, you know, is, I think, I think is, it's RPA, is RPA different from AI in, in, in terms of ethics? Does it not raise ethical questions? I think it's. I think it's. There, there are other. Eth it does raise ethical questions, but I think there's slightly different ones because I think you know any rules based automation. It's it's much easier to see the cause and effect. You know, if you're generating unfair outcomes, let's say for people applying for for mortgages, it's usually easier to spot that than with AI, where th there is a bit more of that black box. Having said that, one of the key elements to any good uh, machine learning platform is that you get good accuracy you know you need to build stuff in the right space of time it can't take a year to build out a model but having an explainable model you know and it's one of the things that if you go and talk to any commercial provider of, of auto ml platforms they will harp on about not only the accuracy of their models but the high degree of explainability because regulators need to better look at that and say well you know how, what are the features in your data set that you are considering when you're deciding whether to reject a model or not and the, the whole um, ethical issue of how can you make sure that, you, that there is no bias. I mean, Cam makes a very good point, and, and I'm going to steal that joke, by the way, mate. Thank you. Um, there are technical ways of doing it. You know, you choose the right learning model. Um, you know, you, you choose a representative data set. Um, you can monitor performance using real data, you know, rather than going and saying, well, we're going to test and test and train and train, which can lead to the overtraining problem. Uh, maybe you go and ask a completely different question. We've got uh, people applying for mortgages. Right. I'm going to I'm going to go and find uh, 50 people who are over six foot and 50 people who are under five foot six and feed that real data into the model and see if we get weird results. But it is hard. 
you know, you are dealing with a much more complex, when you're dealing with AI or subset of AI, we call AutoML, you're dealing with much more complicated bits of technology. Okay, we're into the last five minutes now, but that's where I, where I, 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 there's a couple of things we still need to cover, but I want to, I always like to, to include what the audience are doing. One of our panelists has, has, one of our audience members has said, one of the panelists mentioned RPA is cheap. Is it really? What are the hidden costs of maintenance and keeping it running in production? And I like that question because I, I think it would be, un, it'd be remiss of us not to at least look about the, the, talk about the returns and the costs of, of, of doing this. You know, we've talked repeatedly this afternoon about how automation can make things cheaper, but are, we, are people who are investing in this technology actually getting the returns that they want? And are those returns one off or are they sustainable? Can I can I go first on this? I'm going to be slightly controversial. Um, yeah, I think I think now they are. Um, you know, if you look at the cost of a of a bot compared to the cost of a of a human FTE to do some of those rules based tasks, it, it's way 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 cheaper. An order of magnitude, order of magnitude and a half cheaper. And there are plenty of companies out there. You know, um, uh, Citibank, a good example, 200,000 staff offshore four and a half years ago, and their stated aim was to try and automate 20% of those roles. So whatever, 20, so 40,000 times by 15,000 a year, whatever it is, that's a huge, big uh, aim. And Citibank are, are along that path. They're a good way along that path. So I think the big change we've seen recently is I think the early days of RPA there were there was a lot of money spent with um, some of the very very large consultancies out there who learned on the job, and I think there were huge amounts of uh, huge sums thrown at some very big projects that didn't deliver because we didn't really know you know what we were doing. The people building out the bots didn't know what we were doing, and those business models are how many consultants at fifteen hundred bucks a day can I charge you for, Mister Customer? A lot of those consultancy business models were all about extracting as much money at the front of the, you know, to build out automations as possible. The business models for the RPA providers actually, and I don't work there anymore, I promise, were actually much more aligned with the customers. The more you automate, the more benefit you get, the more uh, automation software I can sell you. But that fundamental maths of how much a bot costs, and you can go and do that research for yourself, how much a bot costs compared to how much just that human labor costs, even for you add in the accuracy benefits and, 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 uh, yes, I think there are many companies uh, getting huge benefit, which has led to you look at if you want proof, go and look at the valuations of the automation companies. Now, some of that's hype, but that hype won't last forever. OK, well, we've got, we've got a specific question, on that, which, I, which only one member of our panel can actually answer. But Cam, why don't you just give us a, a quick take on what James is talking about? They described how uh, RPA is enabling a certain bank to out arbitrage the labor arbitrage mm -hmm. of offshoring. Yeah, and, and we've seen that. We've seen that multiple times. Uh, plenty of examples in folks that I've worked with uh, at ATB Finance. You know, we work. We focused on their operational efficiencies and customer service. And with the with the digital workforce that they they, they got in place, they they had. And I kid you not, a ninety nine percent improvement in the turnaround time from end to end. Mm. I mean, that's incredible. Um, and you know, they 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 managed to reduce the call center volumes. They managed to massively reduce the risk involved, mistakes that were being made. I mean, the savings wasn't just look at the cost of a digital worker uh, versus the cost of an FTE, but the improvements were phenomenal, a 99% improvement. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, you know, you couldn't get that with, with kind of- Okay, you know, that's great. Thanks. And now, this question is for you, Bob, because you're the only person really qualified to answer it, which is, for RPA vendors, the leaders are Blue Prism, Automation Anywhere, and UiPath. Why choose one over the other? Are there others disrupting the market? What about Microsoft, who just bought Soft Motive? What about their RPA tools? How do you choose between vendors, Bob? Um, I think there's a common set of capabilities. I always look at the uh, ability to support customers and to be able to do so in a small, medium-sized environment. That's my core competency in our, in our target market at Next Stop. So, so to me, uh, it really is a... Uh, it's a relationship type and, and support type uh, benefit that I look for. Mm -hmm. And is this, uh, is this AI for, for small companies as well as large? I believe so, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's converging for a number of reasons, uh, learnings from the past. Uh, as uh, I believe uh, James mentioned, uh, you know, people are more uh, adept at, at, at doing this, this new technology. But the key is uh, SMEs don't have that internal expertise 
So they do need some handholding, some onboarding. And once again, that gets back to the ability to really uh, engage with the uh, supplier and, and, and uh, move them forward in a very predictable and, and uh, ROI achievable way. Okay, Look, our, our time is almost up, but I'd like to end by asking some very high level questions, but ones which seem very important to me. And the, there's three of them. And the first of them is, uh, why haven't these technologies had a much more visible impact on productivity? I think part of it is, you know, when you achieve big success, do you really want to go and tell your competitors what you're doing? You know, one of my greatest frustrations working in all these industries is you do a really big deal and you'd say, hey, can we tell the whole world about it because it helps us sign the next deal? And the answer 95% of the time is no. So what you actually see in the press very much is, is the tip of the iceberg. But lots of people copied Henry Ford, did they not, Cam? No, uh, yes, but he's selling something that sits on people's driveways. Whereas when you sell somebody, you know, on an artificial intelligence platform or an RPA platform, it's sat within their company. It's simply not as visible. But um, if you go and, and do a straw poll of all the, you know, like I say, the FTSE 100 or, you know, the top 500 companies across the world, ask them which ones of these are using these digitally transformative technologies, 95% of them plus will put their hands up. And it's still, not, it's still not showing up in the economic statistics, is it? No, we, we, don't, we don't have a tax for uh, digital workers yet, right? We don't have a robot in our tax yet. And, you know, I don't know whether that will come about or not, but, you know, there's certainly some talk of it and we, we don't measure it in that way. So when a company manages to return 100,000 FTE hours, we don't count that as, uh, as the company's um, sort of against, against the people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I agree with James and I, I've seen, you know, I've been absolutely in this situation where, large organizations or even you know medium-sized organizations bring in new technology makes them massively more successful improves their customer um, satisfaction increases their turnover and, and, and profitability and they will absolutely not want to talk about it it's, it's uh, maybe the right, we're, not, we're, not me we're not measuring it correctly among other things so um just just a, a, a closing question and I'll, I'll i'll give this to you first francesco because it's a it's um it, it's it's almost a philosophical question um, and it's in two parts. The first is, is AI a general purpose technology like, which I mean like electricity. Electricity had this amazing effect on economies everywhere. Uh, it took a long time for it to have that effect, 50 or 60 years, but in the 20th century, it transformed everything. Uh, and if we have this, this digital technology now achieving very high sophisticated forms. And it's been around 50 or 60 years now, but it has not had that type of, of transformative effect. Does that mean it's not a general purpose technology? It may be something, something else, or do you think we're now starting to see truly economically transformative effects coming through? Uh, quickly, yes and no. Uh, meaning, uh, yes, it is a, a, a general purpose technology. Um, even, th even though probably like it's not as, well, it's not general like in the same fashion like electricity is. Honestly, I never really like this, like this type of comparison because I think that you are looking at, you know, like comparing peers and apples, which is not like 100% correct. Uh, but it is general enough. Uh, and um, I think that we probably like go like over over time if we if we jump like on the reasons why like it, it didn't work out like in the 70s or 80s or 90s or whatever. But there is like, a, well, there, there are a couple of specific reasons why it started working out, you know, six, seven years ago. So if you actually go back in time, there is a specific, you know, point in time that you can trace back and say, hey, like December 2012 was the real moment where things started getting back on track for AI. Um, and again, there are multiple reasons. There has been a specific, you know, use of a specific algo on a specific data sets. Uh, we can we can talk about it like in a different, um, you know, different setting, different forum. But um, honestly, uh, uh, yeah, just like to wrap up my question, general, of course. Uh, and if you haven't seen it yet, like the results in in your in your um, you know daily life to some extent, is because not everyone you know caught up on uh, using AI properly up to date, uh, which is not like a problem that financial markets has, but like also like generally speaking. And um, also to add one comment to this, which is also related to what James and Cam were discussing before, 
eventually any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? So eventually people don't talk about it because I mean, who cares if you can do like, you know, identity recognition for your app because of computer vision? No one. I mean, as soon as you can do that, it stop like become interesting for like the rest of the world. I mean, for us, it's super cool that you can, you know, recognize words and faces and all those things. But eventually, like the most of people don't care. So why, why, why should I tell like to someone that I'm using like CV to do, you know, automatic claim processes for my car when the only thing that you need to know as a client is that you have an app, you take a picture that's done, boom. Um, so it's a bit of a combination of like a couple of different things. Yeah, I'm a bit dismayed by what you said. I've just published, just published an article in which I say that uh, data is not the new oil, it's the new electricity. Uh, so I'm obviously comparing apples and pears myself. So um, anyway, just we must stop now, but I'd like each of you to ask, answer this, this, this general question. Are we en route towards an artificial general intelligence? And perhaps I could put that to you first, Ian. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, longer term, yes. Yes, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we've obviously within IBM, there are a huge amount of research focus continues in, in AI. Uh, and a, a number of years ago, there was, I mean, Project Debata that enabled, you know, I mean, a computer to digest a wealth of material, knowledge articles, and then have a debate, you know, I mean, with a, a human and, and, and give good form and context to the argument that it was making. So I think, you know, I mean, in, in short, Dominic, yes, I think, you know, I mean, that this technology is rapidly developing as well as becoming more and more available. So, you know, I mean, we should embrace it. As I say, that the messages we augment with it, though, we work alongside it as humans. I don't foresee a world where, you know, I mean, it's just pure automation. James, what's your, your take on this? It's, it seems to me that the, the AI, as we currently have it, is just throwing processing power piles of, of data. It, it's useful, but how does that evolve into artificial general intelligence? So, so there's two things, yeah. There's applying intelligence and artificial intelligence by definition, because it's not humans doing it, to specific problems. And that's what we're talking about really today. And that, that's what you use in business today. And that will become more and more and more and more. And in 10 years or 20 years, you'll look back and go, God, do you remember when we used to have like people making that particular sort of business decision in the same way that now we go, wow, do you remember when, when people used to write down columns of numbers and add them all up at the end instead of using a spreadsheet? So that's going to become more and more and more. It will take a long time, I think, to get to a, a, a general purpose intelligence. Think of it like cars, yeah? We're still in the Model T phase, all right? And it took a very long time to get to the autonomous driving car. In fact, we're not even quite there yet. And I think that's the journey we're on. I think it's a long, it will happen because too much money will be thrown at it because there's an obvious endpoint there, but it's a long, long way away. And by the time we get there, there will be AI embedded piecemeal, if you like, into every single thing we do, both at work and at home. When I was at school, we didn't even have these. I had a slide rule uh, I'm that old. Bob. Um, yes, I, I agree. Um, I, I think it's, it's inevitable. I mean, this is about thinking on its own, the, the system. Uh, if we extrapolate the acceleration of use um, and familiarity and, and the uh, evolution of uh, the growing need for data scientists and others, uh, eventually that'll happen. Uh, how to predict that and what date is very difficult, but that's definitely in our future. I would say probably 10, 15, 20 years from now, something like that. Francesco, a quick answer from you on AGI before we, we get, uh, get Cam to wrap us up. Uh, you know how people say it's, it's very it's very hard like, to do prediction, especially about the future, right? So I don't I don't you know do predictions. Okay, Cam, are we heading towards an artificial general intelligence? And if so, are you going to miss people like me? You're going to miss humanity when we're all. Well, I don't think we'll ever miss you, Dominic, or the human touch. Um, I think that will always be the case. I think one of the things that uh, humans, included we all struggle with is the idea of exponential. We really struggle with this idea of exponential growth. We don't get it. We think we think in a linear fashion, but if you actually look at the, the, the world of AI, the, the strides that are being made almost on a monthly basis are magnitudinal, exponentially. We are moving an exponential race. So when we talk about, when I hear folks saying 15, 20 years, I think you're thinking linear. 
this thing is not linear. It's moving at a pace. And, you know, James mentioned auto ML uh, um, uh, and, and I think he's on the money there uh, because I think that's where you get artificial intelligence that's going to then create artificial intelligence for you at a speed that no data scientist could ever do. And it will suddenly get this, you know, moment that we, some, some folks talk about singularity. But to bring it back to artificial intelligence as a whole, human intelligence is not a single machine. It's not a model. It's multiple models that all interact and are orchestrated in a very complex way in order to bring this about. It's not just about having something like GPT-3 that can mimic humans and be able to write that, or it's not like computer vision. It's all of those things combined. And I think we are, we are moving in that direction. But I think in, if we are going to arrive at an artificial general intelligence, we're going to have to have machines that have sensors, that have that processing power and have actuators and how can affect the world and learn from it in a way. And I think we're, we're well on the way. So my prediction is we'll see it in this decade. Wow, that's a great point to stop. And we really must stop there. It's been a really rich and really good fun discussion. I myself am thinking of at least 25 questions I still want to explore. So I'm already looking forward to part two of this discussion, but we must leave it there now. I'd like to thank our panelists, Bob Bonomo, Francesca Correa, James Denning, uh, Ian Robertson, and uh, um, Cam. Uh, star. Uh, our next webinar is uh, is next Tuesday, 2nd of March, uh, same time, same place. Uh, that's 1400 here on Zoom. In it, we'll be discussing open data, the topic which many of us believe has a transformative power, at least as great uh, as that of AI, to which it is closely linked. We hope as many of you as possible will join us then. Uh, but for now, it's goodbye from the six of us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You can find this discussion on www.futureoffinance.biz and indeed other uh, planned webinars under current events. I am Wendy Gallagher. If you would like uh, more information about how to work with us, please do email on wendy.gallagher at futureoffinance.biz. Thank you once again.